Well, good afternoon and good evening. Welcome to the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library. My name is John Highbush, and I have the honor of being executive director of the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation. Several years ago, uh, I served with the American Red Cross, and I think I would be remiss, and you would probably count me as being remiss, if this evening I didn't ask us all to remember the, it sounds like, maybe tens of thousands of people that have been injured or lost their lives in Haiti. Um, this takes me back to my, my roots at the Red Cross. There's so many great organizations that I know that will help these people that are in our hearts right now. Uh, but if you're looking for one, I know the Red Cross, you can reach them at redcross.org or at 1-800-RED-CROSS. And if you would, if you just join me for a moment of silence for the victims of this disaster. Thank you. Before we get started, there's a few people with us here tonight that I'd like to recognize. Uh, first, we have with us Mr. Hector Barreto, the former administrator of the Small Business Administration under President George Bush. Hector is currently the chairman of the Latino Coalition. Hector, where are you here? Thank you. Also with us is Mary Bush, a former representative of the board of the International Monetary Fund under President Reagan. Mary? Uh, finally, we have with us Mr. Duke Blackwood, the director of the Ronald Reagan Library Museum. I've met, I think, just about every one of the library directors, and Duke is the best. Duke? <laughs> Rather than simply introduce our speaker this afternoon, what I'd like to do is welcome him home. While Michael Steele, the chairman of the Republican Party, has never technically called California his home, I can assure you that here in Reagan country, he fits right in. Now, the reasons for this are many. First, for those of you who have already read his book, I think you will agree that it reads much like a manifesto that Ronald Reagan himself could have penned when running for president. To quote Michael from his book, Quote, we are united by our faith in the power and ingenuity of the individual to build a nation through hard work, personal responsibility, and self-discipline. That is the sacred ground upon which our Republican Party was built. For the sake of all Americans, it is the ground we must reclaim. Indeed, Michael Steele's message that the road back to victory for the Republican Party is all about sticking with conservative principles is so true to President Reagan's ideology that you will find in the appendix of his book a full reprint of Ronald Reagan's famous A Time for Choosing speech from 1964. That is not only a very familiar speech around here, but all around the country. Chairman Steele also fits right in here because like our former president, he grew up in a Democrat household and switched parties as a young man. He then went on to build a career of remarkable first the first African-American ever to be elected chairman of any state Republican Party, the first African-American elected to statewide office as Lieutenant Governor of Maryland, and finally, the first African-American ever to be elected as chairman of the Republican Party. Now, if you have heard or read about Michael Steele this past year, most especially this past week, you might have heard some noise about his style or his message as chairman. Let me tell you from my experience what some of this noise is all about. I have a little experience in this area as I ran one of the national party committees and I've heard this before. By and large, it comes from the wisdom of conventional thinkers inside the beltway. It's coming from many in the party that believe if they simply keep their heads down, if they simply lay low while the Democrat party overreaches philosophically to the left and essentially defeats itself, then that alone will bring the Republican Party back in power. But I think Chairman Steele is making waves across this country because he is essentially asking the question that Ronald Reagan would. Power to do what? I hope that for those of us who are Republicans, we have learned a lesson in the last decade, and that is, it is not enough to simply win. 
It's only enough when we win and we lead with ideas and ideals that are true to what it means to be a Republican. Chairman Steele is forthright, he is direct, he is a man of courage and conviction, and in the face of inherited a badly broken national party, some heavy fire from the media, and the odds guess stacked against him, well guess what, he's also a winner. In November of 2009, there were two statewide races of any consequence in these United States for the governorship of New Jersey and Virginia, and Michael Steele led the party that brought Republicans resounding victories in both states. <laughs> to top it off, he is the most senior ranking Republican that I know of who has had the courage to enter the lion's den for Republicans, nationally televised shows like Bill Maher's Real Time or Steve Colbert's Colbert Report, and not only come out alive, but also representing his party in this country with grace, dignity, and some common sense. So, <laughs> speaking of common sense, before I ask Chairman Steele to come up here, I can't help but quote from one more passage that's very relevant from his book. Quoting Steele, some Republicans today say we need to move on from Ronald Reagan. I am not one of them. And within our own party, we need to make it clear that from now on, there will be a price to pay for abandoning conservative principles. The grassroots activists from tea parties to town halls have sent a message. No more fake it until you make it conservatives. The days of merely espousing conservative principles and then once elected, governing or legislating without principle are over. To that, Chairman Steele. <laughs> so to that, Chairman Steele, I say amen. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the Chairman of the Republican Party, the Honorable Michael Steele. Thank you, Don, that was nice. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. I hadn't even got it started yet. They already fired up. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I cannot begin to tell you, um, John, how much I appreciate uh, your, your remarks and the introduction and just how cool it is to be here. Uh, it really is, uh, when I got I got here earlier today, I was asked, uh, you know, have you been here before? Welcome back. I'm like, no, this is my first time. And I'm like a kid in a candy store. I'm like, okay, ooh, can I see that? Can I touch that? Ooh, that's so cool. The inter interactive part downstairs, it's just all good. And this is a testament, not just to the man, but uh, to the vision of the man uh, and his, his legacy. And you, sir, are a part of a, a wonderful, wonderful group of individuals who have been endowed and I think blessed with the opportunity to hold that legacy and to protect it and to keep it. And so I salute you and uh, the entire foundation board and all of the men and women who spend their time in this magnificent space uh, remembering and celebrating and sharing Ronald Reagan. Thank you, sir, for everything. <laughs> to Certainly to President Reagan of uh, long and fond memory, uh, I thank him uh, because if it weren't for him and my mama, I wouldn't be here uh, as a Republican, and I'll tell you about that in a moment. Uh, but uh, certainly I want to extend a very special uh, and warm thank you uh, to Mrs. Reagan, uh, who is uh, and was one hell of a first lady. And uh, we really appreciate her legacy as well. And please give her my best, uh, John, when you talk to her. Thank you, Mrs. Reagan. Well, there are a whole lot of lessons that I can take from this past year and certainly from the past week and a half. And one of those lessons would be you can't please everyone but you can certainly tick them all off at the same time. <laughs> I've managed to do that and then some over the past year, uh, but uh, I am not uh, spoiled away from 
trying again because I think it's time to shake the party to its foundations in order for it to understand and appreciate the foundation it is on. And so I am, I am really kind of taking a lot in right now. And this evening what I want to do is kind of lay out for you some of the context of my having written this book so that you understand the influence of the man we love and know as Ronald Reagan that he had on a young 17-year-old kid a long time ago. And so it is an interesting journey, and I, and I was reflecting as I was writing this on my time as Lieutenant Governor of Maryland. Now, one of the cool things about being Lieutenant Governor of Maryland that a lot of people don't know is that our state capital is one of the longest running operational uh, state capitals in the country. In fact, it is the longest. And at one time in our wonderful fledgling history, Maryland was the nation's capital. And so the state capital was where everybody kind of met on their way up to this little place called Philadelphia to do something with some paper and constitution or something. I don't know, they were gonna do something. But they were in Maryland having crab cakes and you know all kinds of stuff before they got there. Well, on the second floor of the state capital is the office of the lieutenant governor and the governor. And the lieutenant governor's office was the office formerly occupied by Thomas Jefferson. So for 18 months, Thomas Jefferson worked in this space, which is now the Lieutenant Governor's Office. And when I got there, and I was inaugurated on January 15th, 19, uh, 2003, uh, Martin Luther King birthday, actual birthday. And so it was really kind of a special thing, first African American uh, elected statewide, being inaugurated the first uh, Republican Lieutenant Governor in the state's history. Uh, on that day and then walking from there into the lieutenant governor's office and they say oh by the way this was Thomas Jefferson's office how cool is that <laughs> so every day I would walk into this and this is I'm not lying here I walk into this office every day and I'd stop and I'd look around and I had the office redone in the tradition of Jefferson so it was a lot of the colonial blue and, 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 and the white, the real stark white uh, panel walls, and it was great. And I sit behind the desk, and it was cool, they had a couple of period pieces in there, so you can go and kind of look at, they told me you can't sit on the chair. They had, they had a little rope over, I said, what, well, what do you mean I can't sit on the chair? It's Thomas Jefferson chair, I can't sit on the chair. No, it's an old chair, you can't sit on the chair. I'm like, but I'm the lieutenant governor, I can sit on the chair. No, sir, you can't sit on the chair. So they took the chair out of my office. They did, but before they did, I sat in the chair. <laughs> so, so one day I'm sitting at my desk, and I kid you not, I'm, walk, I'm just I'm taking all this in, and the staff is bringing stuff, and the governor's calling up, and, we're doing and in the midst of all of this, I, I was thinking to myself, wow, here I am, this kid from Washington, D.C., sitting here as the lieutenant governor of Maryland, in Thomas Jefferson's office. Thomas Jefferson must be somewhere thinking to himself, how did a brother wind up in my office? <laughs> well, Sally Hemings has some idea about how that happened, but that's another speech. Um, but from that moment to this, it allowed me to reflect on the journey and the journey we all take, and how unique it is, and how important it is. And the fact that I was able to make that journey was truly a part of the American story. And the fact that all of us in some way are able to make that journey to whatever station and whatever point we are in our lives is part of the American story. So I get a little bit offended when I hear leaders refer to Americans who exercise the rights and privileges granted to us under the Constitution as un-American. And it so goes against what Reagan was all about and what this country has stood for. So as I sat down and thought about what I wanted to say this evening, one of the things that popped in my mind, probably the second thing after my little walk down memory lane was a Chinese proverb or saying that goes, may you live in interesting times. That's a really kind of a neat saying for these times. 
And after the time I've had, it's really appropriate. It's been very interesting. And a friend of mine pointed out to me that that's really a curse. <laughs> so I'm like, well, that's appropriate, you know. But may you live in interesting times. But for this evening, I'd also like to set another tone. And it comes a little bit differently to us from a quote by Frederick Douglass. And Frederick Douglass once noted, I glory in conflict that I may hereafter exult in victory. Now, I really like that for a lot of reasons. The least of which is, as a Roman Catholic, conservative, African-American from Maryland, I know a little bit about conflict. You don't have too many of us walking around. But the reality, the reality for us every day remains that we all find ways to create victory. And in the process of creating victory, there is always conflict. What conflicts us today, however, is a little bit different than what you may think. It's not the ups and downs of elections, but rather the very nature of conservatism in this post-Reagan era. What conflicts us is the vision of the conservative movement, its radical nature and the unique challenges and opportunities that come from both conflict and victory. No great thing has ever been achieved without overcoming obstacles. And no quality is more indispensable to that process than the ability to press on through it, to press on through adversity, to persevere. The first thing to notice about perseverance is that it comes more easily to the optimist. As a young man of 17 years old, I was struck by a man named Ronald Reagan, who was running for president in 1976. Reagan's unwavering optimism and sense of hope moved me. It moved me to think outside of what I thought I knew. It moved me to appreciate the context of how my mother raised me. And in fact, as a young man at that time, before that election, I had to decide, okay, do I do this as a Republican or a Democrat? Now, my mama and my daddy were and are both Democrats. And I remember my mother raised me to, to be a free thinker and to be an independent thinker. So just because she was a Democrat wasn't necessarily meaning that I would be. But the day I told her that I had decided to register as a Republican, she looked at me and she goes, Lord, baby, why you want to do that? <laughs> and I told her, quite honestly, Mom, because you raised me well. And she looked at me. And I had to, and it was quite fun to put into context for her what I meant. Otherwise, it would have been a long way to dinner. And what I meant then, and what I think is important now, is that this man named Reagan translated for me. He translated his convictions, his belief, his values, in such a way that a 17-year-old African-American kid in Washington, D.C., heard something that drew him in. Heard something that connected that value or that principle whatever it was in that moment that I heard him, to how I was raised. And it inspired me. And it enabled me to step courageously into decisions that to this day I still pay a price for. Because it ain't, it ain't easy being a black Republican. <laughs> From Washington, D.C. and Maryland. It just isn't easy. But, what gave strength to my decisions was Reagan's sense of our best days lie before us. And that was captured in the phrase, morning in America. Although that was in 1984, I guess by now, for far too many Americans, it's probably about lunchtime in America. The day is getting older and time is passing us. 
As a young African-American male growing up in our nation's capital, such optimism moved me to understand the power of perseverance and that we are often touched, indeed moved, to action, not by the great figures of history, but by those whose names are not written in history books. Such is the life of Maybell. Now, Maybell is just one of many faces in America who struggled to raise a family and believed that she could offer something more for her children than she herself had received. She is one of those many faces who believed in writing the history of America, not just in those history books, but on our hearts and consciences, so that the promise of America would become its truth. She grew up the daughter of sharecroppers and had to quit school in the fifth grade to work the cotton fields of South Carolina. She married a man who abused her both mentally and physically, and he would die at the age of 36 from the alcoholism that drove him. She would go on to work for 45 years in a laundry, and the most she would ever make for her family on the day she retired was $3.83 an hour. Despite the hardships that come from limited resources and limited opportunity, Maybell had an extraordinary sense of the possible. She did what it took to stimulate the economy of her household, to make certain that, as she put it, it was she and not the government who raised her children. And she did a pretty good job. Her daughter turned out to be a very successful and accomplished pediatrician. And her son stands before you as the chairman of the Republican National Committee. Now, Maybell's life embodies perseverance. The struggles and challenges of her time would, be, would hold the hope and the opportunity for her children. Now, while Maybell's story, like so many of ours, contained many hardships, she always found a way to turn her hopes that her children would be better off than she into action. She made sure her kids knew the value of hard work, both in school and in the workplace. She made sure we could think for ourselves. She made sure we had a good education. She made sure we knew right from wrong and did what was right. She had our behinds in church on Sunday morning and our noses in the books on Monday. She didn't need a nanny state to help her raise her kids. Through the remarkable example of her life and her will, my mother was the first person who taught me about fiscal discipline, the value of a dollar, budgeting, and most importantly, how thoughtful investment, when coupled with hard work, can provide empowerment and opportunity. And while her bank account may not have been that rich for her, she was rich in purpose as every day she found a way to turn her hopes into action. It was this, her relentless focus on the future, that enabled her to overcome her circumstances and to do so with an incredible amount of selfless grace. Maybell was never discouraged by the trials of the moment because she knew that they would pass and because she was in it for the long haul. That is the essence of perseverance. That's Reagan. And that is part of the legacy that has been passed on to us by his leadership. And when I told my mother, she reminded me of Reagan. She was like, what? <laughs> but I knew how that translated both ways. Her life struggle and how she overcame. And Ronald Reagan coming before America after Watergate, after Vietnam, after frustration and anxiety and looking America in the eye and saying this way, our better days lie before us. Persevere, stand strong, better days are to come. And I had one of those moments where I had to really test the waters on this perseverance thing because in 2006 I ran for the U.S. Senate and as you recall, that was not a very good year to run for anything as a Republican. But we did. 
And on election night, I'm sitting there on the couch and I'm watching the returns come in and there's always that point where in the beginning of the evening, you're like, yeah, <laughs> we're gonna be okay. Well, maybe we're not gonna be okay. <laughs> that quick it turns. And my frustration and my anger grew. And I didn't know what to do. I, you know, I'm like, we were right there. We put all the pieces together. We ran the kind of campaign that actually spoke to people. It was very Reagan-esque, if you will, in its style and its approach. But here we were on election night losing. And my wife is sitting next to me saying absolutely nothing. She was being that pillar of strength. And then finally, after a little bit of ranting and raving on my part, I finally sighed very heavily and said, what am I gonna do now? And my wife turned to me with only the love that a spouse could give another spouse and said, well, I guess you better get a job. <laughs> well, that was comforting. <laughs> but how true it was, you know? <laughs> I better get to work. And I was a little taken aback, a little bit annoyed. <laughs> Not a whole lot of love there. But I understood. And in that moment, I began to appreciate the legacy of both Maybell and Reagan. That legacy that had been handed down to me to persevere, to see tomorrow despite the ugliness and difficulties of today. The great thing about America is that there are Maybells everywhere in this room. And they are the ones who made and will continue to make this country what it is. The great thing about Ronald Reagan was that he knew that. Ronald Reagan understood the importance of connecting to the Maybells of America through the themes that inspired us and policies that restored the strength, pride, and prosperity of this nation. President Reagan did the unthinkable. He helped America embrace conservatism and the core beliefs of the movement. In essence, he made it cool to be a conservative. He made it cool to be a Republican. And today, and you've had this conversation, I know, since his passing, all these people who are now Reagan Republicans, when you know 20 years ago, they were blowing the brother up about something, right? They were just going after Reagan about this, that, the other thing. But the reality of it is, the power of what he did lasted enough to influence these times. But since then, America has changed and our movement has changed too. But what we believe has not. In the words of Austin Powers, we need to get our mojo back. <laughs> we really do. Some are conflicted over the vision of the conservative movement and at a loss to grasp the unique opportunities that lie before us. Some still are without a voice or a direction for leading in these changing times. And even more of us stand on the precipice of conservatism ready to either jump off or throw each other off because we feel as if we have lost our grip on what it means to be a Reagan conservative. But you and I know what it means. You and I know that the issues that united us during the Reagan revolution of the 1980s, lower taxes, less government, certainly less government spending and regulation, free markets, imagine that, and strong national security are the same issues that motivate voters today. We must never lose faith in the power and ingenuity of the individual to create the legacy of a nation through hard work and self-sacrifice and discipline. It was important to put that in this book, to remind us and each other of why we do what we do and why we believe what we believe. Because it's never about government and institutions, it's about individuals. A group of men and women decided to get on a boat and go across some water and Lord knows where they will land up, but well, you know, we'll make the most of it. And a few years after they get there, they kind of form themselves into this little thing they try to call a perfect union of individual states. And these states would then cobble together this piece of paper that would define them. And that piece of paper has stood the test of wars, 
conflict, ugliness, segregation, and has defined us as individuals united to call ourselves American. We must once again reaffirm to the American people our core belief that government should be limited so that it never becomes powerful enough to infringe on the rights of the individual, that taxes should be kept low so that individuals might keep more of their hard-earned money. Hello? <laughs> Imagine that. And benefit, and benefit, that individual can benefit from the economic power that saving, investing, gives you. We must remember that businesses regulate themselves and we regulate them to encourage entrepreneurs to take risks so that more individuals can enjoy the satisfaction and fruits of self-made success. That the ideal of a colorblind society is worth fighting for because each man and woman is an individual and not a member of some hyphenated class or group. Now some just talk about change and I think we've heard a lot about that over the last couple of years. But it is what we believe and what we know about the resilience of the American people that will underscore the real change this nation needs. Ladies and gentlemen, our work is not done. In so many ways, our work begins anew, not in the sense of starting over, but starting with a different perspective, a 21st century perspective, focused on how we will make the hopes of tomorrow a reality today. That's what this is all about outside these walls right now. Families are scared. Businesses are closing. Individuals are being told the government is the better solution for what ails you. Not appreciating what Ronald Reagan appreciating, appreciated is that the government is the problem. It is what ails us. But to be honest with you, I'm just a little bit tired of hoping for the sake of hope, okay? For me, it is no longer enough to hope for safety and security in my home or here or abroad, but by those who threaten our neighborhoods and our shores. It is no longer enough to hope for a better education for our kids. Certainly, it's no longer enough to hope for an economy that grows and expands for all members of our community. It is no longer enough to say, hope is on the way. Keep hope alive. Hope you have a nice day. <laughs> no, those seeking a job, struggling to save a business, trying to raise a family, the illiterate, the suffering, the addicted, the homeless, they demand more from our generation than hope because hope by itself is not a strategy nor a solution. What they demand and what Ronald Reagan would expect us to provide is an opportunity to heal and to teach, to turn dreams into reality, and hope into action for the kid growing up on the streets instead of in a home, for the business owner who takes the risks to build an economy, for the family struggling to make ends meet, for the teacher mired in paperwork while her students are mired in a failing school. Thurgood Marshall once said that none of us has gotten where we are solely by pulling ourselves up from our own bootstraps. We got here because somebody bent down and helped us. While the next generation of leaders and entrepreneurs in business, education, science, and industry are counting on us to still believe the American dream is alive for them. They look to us to bend down and to help them not only to survive, but to succeed as generations before bent down for us. This is the legacy of the Maybells of America. We now have an unprecedented opportunity to share that legacy with America. We also have an opportunity to move America in a new direction with a new vision and a truer appreciation of what it means when morning dawns anew. So my friends, it is not yet lunchtime in America. Thank God. It is morning again. And in a sense, it will always be morning in America because America is morning. It is a place of eternal promise and potential a place where the son of a sharecropper's daughter can realize the dream of his ancestors and fulfill the promise of a nation. In most of the world, such things simply do not happen, or at least not very often. But 
Ronald Reagan, and my mother Maybell, and each one of you understand that this is the quality more than any other that makes America special. America remains that one place on earth where possibility meets opportunity. And you know what we call that? The American dream. It is the quality that makes America, as Ronald Reagan called it, a shining city on a hill. But that city does not shine as the moon and a reflection of light from some other source. Instead, it shines as the sun under its own power. And the source of that light is within, emanating from the people, the people like Reagan, Maybell, you, and me. That city shines not because of government, but because of her people. It is her people who will make the difference for the family on the brink of poverty or prosperity, not government. And it is her people who will stand shoulder to shoulder, eye to eye, hand in hand, in tough times and good times, like those who gathered just to have a little tea party, not government. Like Reagan, I put my faith in people, not government. His spirit reminds us that the promise of America is the promise of those endless possibilities. The optimism and hope that emanates from such possibilities enables us to persevere and empowers us not to give up on ourselves or this land that we love. Next year, our nation will celebrate the centennial of President Reagan's birth. Between now and then, we have an opportunity to reignite his vision of and for America. To remind ourselves and the nation that it is morning again in America, a morning bright with possibilities, the morning of the day representing the rest of our lives. President Reagan said it better than I ever could when he said, we've got to quit talking to each other and about each other and go out and communicate to the world that we may be fewer in numbers than we have ever been, but we carry the message they're waiting for. Wow, how important is that right now? This is your time. This is our moment to be the light of this great nation once again. To lift up this beacon, this grand experiment we call America. Ronald Reagan would expect us to do no less. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you. You take questions. You want to mm -hmm. take them from up here? Or from I'll probably go down. Yeah. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chairman Steele. Chairman Steele has been gracious enough to uh, spend about 10, 12 minutes answering some of your questions. So. If you have a question, if you could please just raise your hand. We have uh, several staff located throughout the audience who will bring a microphone to you. Please don't start speaking until they bring you the mic. So, yes, we have a question right over here. You're going to hold it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I would just like to ask, you talked about you as a 17-year-old. And who do we have in the Republican Party today that can touch those 17 year olds today because our education system mm -hmm. they're all far left as far as I'm concerned <laughs> and they are literally programming our young people can that is there anyone in the Republican sure, Party that absolutely can do this? absolutely there is who do you think it is who's that all of you all of you absolutely it's you it's you what, what I wanted to try to illustrate was how in my household, as broken as, at times as it was, as difficult as it was, you know, watching what was going on from day to day and moment to moment, that there were lessons that were being taught as well. That as I got older, I began to put in context and could appreciate uh, against everything else I was seeing outside the, you know, my home. And so for me, as a young man, you know, kind of looking at how mom kind of laid down the law, 
and how she would work things, whether it was trying to balance getting enough food on the table um, or, you know, telling me to do the homework. Now, imagine, this is a woman with a fifth grade education. Uh, when I was in grade school, they came out with this thing called new math. I guess it was new. Um, numbers are numbers, but, you know, but all she knew was one plus one equals two. Two plus four equals six, you know? And she and I would go back and forth about, you know, what she knew about math and what I was learning in the new math. And I remember one day at a parent-teacher's conference and I got into it with the sister because I was like, well, she's not helping me with my homework because, you know, I'm doing this and she keeps telling me all this stuff. And, it, and the sister said, well, she's just telling you differently. But she's right. You're getting the same result. And that was an important lesson as well. And today, as we, as we hear the debates on health care and war and peace and all of that, there are a lot of ways to get there. What matters is the result. And you are already empowered to help young people, especially, to understand what really matters. Because you're talking to a generation who's never seen a real gas line, or has never seen double-digit inflation or double-digit unemployment, and have never had to confront a lot of the hardships because of what Reagan did. Laying a foundation for an economy that continued to grow and grow and grow. But now reality is gonna come, come home a little bit differently. So it's gonna be up to each of us to begin that process and engage in that process of informing and educating. And when you do that, guess what you're doing? You're sharing the legacy, you're sharing the wealth of what we believe and why, why that is so important day in and day out. When we stop doing that is when we stop, we start getting into trouble. When we start, you know, sliding off the road and making stupid mistakes. And the people had us pay a dear price for it. Uh, now individuals, uh, there'll be some will pop up. Uh, certainly Sarah Palin is one and you've got, um, yep, Sarah's straight. We were texting the other night. As I was coming out here, she was like, good luck. Thank you. You're so cool, love the book. Um, she said, thank you. Love your book too. That's fine. Um, but you know, the, the reality of it is, you've got a Sarah, you've got a Mitt Romney, you've got a Mike Huckabee, you've got all these people who are right now, um, uh, you know, on the stage in some sense or another. And there'll be others who will also begin to crystallize uh, the, the message, if you will. Uh, but if we do our homework before all that happens, that message will get received a little bit easier. All right? And there won't be a whole lot of folks like we've seen over the last few years scratching their head going, well, what does that mean? So. Any other questions? Um, yes, sir. Yes, right there. And I'll get you back there, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Oh, real simple. Well, no, 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 it's real easy. It's really, the question was, the spending is out of control. How do we stop that? And it's real easy. Vote them out of office. <laughs> now, let me be clear. Uh, I have said, I've applied that principle to both Democrats and Republicans. All right? So, you as activists, as, as community folks, uh, you know, or just, you know, moderately follow politics, you have been led to believe or informed or got a memo or something, I don't know, that says that you're, you know, once you vote someone into office, you're powerless. Oh, you're done. We'll just wait till the next time to vote. But the reality of it is your, your voice is important. And you've seen the power of the voice of the American people over this past year. The reason they still don't have a health care bill is because of your voice, they've become in the Congress more dysfunctional than they normally are. Because they don't know what to do with it. So keep your voice a part of this discussion because come November, you have the final say. 
believe it or not. You really do. And just because, it's like Bill Cosby said, I brought you in this world, I can take you out. <laughs> I voted you in the office, I'll vote you out. It's that easy. It really is that easy. At some point, you're going to have to draw the line on principle. And in this book, the urgency of it is right now. It's right now. You can't afford to let this go down the road any further. And if anything gets passed that you don't like, you need to start asking candidates, when you get to Washington, will you undo it? Because if you're going to accept it, well, it's already done, we can't change it, then I'm sorry, I can't put you into office to continue supporting bad stuff. Is that important? Yes, ma'am. I, I promised the lady in the back, and then I'll come up here. Yes, ma'am. You had. Yes, ma'am. Don't be shy. Obama had encumbered us with. Uh, we're heading. Do, do you feel we'll have oh, severe inflation? Yes, I do. Um, there are projections right now coming out of some of the smart minds, the smarter minds in Washington, those who aren't concerned about how it reads or what it says. We're acknowledging that by the time we get to September, unemployment should be somewhere around 10.8%. Um, you've already begun to see a number of the indices show an uptick in uh, the cost of money, uh, inflation. Uh, certainly, interest rates are now beginning to move. Uh, now, the Fed is doing some things to try to keep it from moving too much, but it's going to move. The bottom line is, you and I know, if in your household, you go spend $1,000, and you only bring home $2,000 a month, and you've just spent 1,000 of it, and you've got $1,500 worth of bills to pay, you see how the math kind of gets a little squirrely? All right? So the reality for this government is, having spent the trillion dollars that you and I don't have, at some point the bill comes due. And when it comes due, it has a direct impact on everyone's bottom line. The reason why a lot of businesses aren't hiring at the rate the administration wants them to is what? They don't know what tomorrow holds and what they suspect it holds is not good for them. And so they're not taking the risk that Reagan and others have encouraged entrepreneurs to take over the years by creating a marketplace in which they could freely go and play. Just ask our former SBA director, I mean, what he did I know during my tenure as lieutenant governor was something we tried to emulate in the state government because it was good stuff. He opened up doors for small businesses to do what? Get access to capital and credit. And he worked with banks. He didn't threaten them. He didn't have to threaten them, right, Hector? You just said, hey, this is a partnership. Here are all these folks over here who like to do business. You want to play? Let's play. If you don't, they'll go someplace else. They get it. He didn't have to threaten them. But now you've created an environment in which small business owners, and any of you, of you here who are small business owners know this, you're not incentivized to do anything but hunker down if you value the asset that you have. And so there is no encouragement to go out and invest. And as a result, that has an effect on the markets. It has an effect on cash and credit. It has an effect on capital. It has an effect on a whole lot of things, especially the bottom line, jobs you're not going to hire. It's too risky. You know, I'd love to hire this young man for, for employment, but I'm sorry, sir, I can't. I've got 10 employees and going to 11 is too risky. I'd love to expand my business so I could do more over on this part of town as well as on this part of town, but you know what? Yeah, I'll just have to get in your car and come over here because it's too risky. And that's the environment we live in right now. And this administration fundamentally does not understand that. Or do they? Ah, uh, or do they? I think they do. I think they understand it so well that they want to change it. And that's the trouble we have. Yes, sir, over here, I saw, yes, sir, and then we'll get you, sir. Yes. Uh, Mr. Still, of all the reprehensible things that this administration has done, the thing that uh, is so worrisome to me is the health care bill, mm -hmm. because I think it could be permanently devastating to America. 
and that I'm fearful and I believe that it would uh, tip us, it would be the tipping point for socialism. Now anything else they've done and everything else they've done is undoable. I don't know of any entitlement program, never mind the greatest entitlement program that we've ever had, that's been overturned. All right. So that causes me to be less optimistic, and I'm a very optimistic person mm -hmm. uh, than you are. So could you address that, please? Well, um, I'm optimistic about what lies ahead because, uh, you know, if we give up on this little experiment we call America, if we give up on the freedoms that so many have fought and died for, What's it all for? What are we doing? Um, and I just refuse to do that. I refuse to believe that even despite this administration and the ilk that kind of run things right now, that uh, good people of goodwill will win the day. And they'll win the day by putting leadership in place that understands what everyday life is like. They'll win the day by, uh, as we've already begun to see, putting their voice in the mix. Think about this. A year ago, almost literally a year ago, how did you feel? What did you think? And you, you would say, you were very negative, yeah. Now think about where we are a year later. Okay, that was a setup. But I know it's not true. I know after the summer we've seen and the elections in New Jersey and Virginia, and you pick up the newspaper and see what's happening in Massachusetts, you've got to feel just a little bit better, right? So the point is this. What Reagan understood and how he was able to cobble together a governing coalition that frustrated the purposes of the Democrats was that Americans generally believe tomorrow will be better than today. Not by anything government does, but by what they will be empowered to do. And that is the argument that we must continue to make. And the reason I feel so good about tomorrow is because today doesn't look as bad as it could have been. And that's because good people of goodwill stood up. Moms and dads took off from work and went to town hall meetings. Grandmas and granddads got off the summer porch and actually went down to the little corner, you know, meeting place and had a conversation with the congressman. That is what is so important right now. And don't give up on that. Please don't give up on that. Because if, if you do, they win. If you do, they win. And they're counting on you forgetting and just moving on with your life. And, you know, so we'll, we'll go ahead and put this little thing in place called health care. And then in a few years, you can actually access the system. But in the meantime, you'll pay a lot for it now. And I mean, think about this. How crazy is this? This tells you what the government's all about. That's like you're going to a car dealer and buying a car putting $25,000 cash down for the car, and he tells you you can take delivery in four years. Would you buy that car? And that's why the American people aren't buying this health care. So the fight is on, and we're in, we're in it. And I feel very optimistic about where we're going. And it's because a lot of stuff is coming, not from the halls of Washington, and not from all the smart people who get hired and paid a lot of money to tell politicians what they think by the very people who tell politicians what they think by that little thing called the vote. You. And that's making all the difference right now. So I look at last year, and I look at today, and I look down the road to November and beyond, I feel very good. I really do. And you should too. Get him, I get them, and then one more. Two more. Two more. All right. Because I, I want to get the lady over here if I could. Is that, is that right? Okay. I don't want to get in touch, trouble with the Reagan folks because, you know, it's, it's not good. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you, perfect uh, lead into my question. It's about November mm -hmm. and the strategy 
for winning in November? Yes. I'm glad you asked that question because, as you probably read, <laughs> I got in a little trouble uh, with the Washington types because I was, well, honest. And they don't like that too much sometimes. But, you know, it, someone said to me, well, you're the chairman of the party. You should be the cheerleader. And I said, no, I should be the leader. I should be honest. And I should be practical and pragmatic because people are entrusting us with a lot of their hard-earned dollars that in a recession they can't afford to just send out the door. So when you get that $20 or that dollar or that $5, whatever it is, you treat it as if it came out of your own account. And so you need to be smart. And when I look down the road, uh, I feel very good, as I said. I'm very optimistic. But I'm also aware that the people, you, have set a new standard. You've set a higher bar. And the bar is very simply this, and the standard is simply this. If you wish us to entrust you with the office you seek, then you better not go in and do what you did before. You better not go and give us same old, same old. Don't go do the very things that we kicked you out of office for in 06. Don't go out and say you're going to lead with the principles of a contract with America, for example, and act as if you just made a contract with the devil. And that's the difference. If we are principled in our leadership, if we have candidates that are principled conservatives that are prepared to go out and state the case for the kind of reforms in health care and in the environment and the economy that are necessary for this country to stand tall and free, independent of government, then we'll win. And we'll take the control that is necessary to lead. But if you don't feel that, if you feel that candidates are just saying the words but not doing the deeds, we won't. And that's all I was saying, but I'm not supposed to say that as the chairman of the RNC. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I'm not going to lie to you either. I'm just not. And so that's why they say, well, put a muzzle on them. I'm like, no, no. Even Maybell couldn't do that. So, so the reality of it is for us right now is realizing what we left, what we came out of, this mess of 06 and 08 the lack of faith and trust in our leaders and the principles of the party because people feel we walked away from them. So now we need and we must walk back towards them and get into them and lead with them. And if we do that, we're going to have a bang up year. And if you want any examples of it, just need to look at New Jersey, Virginia, and now in Massachusetts. Those individuals have run on those principles. They have not been afraid to say what they believed and have not been afraid to apply those principles to their everyday lives. And they're winning. So I feel good about that too. Yes, ma'am. And this is the last one. Okay. My, my view is the crux of the problem is when we the Republicans had control, we did not govern as Republicans. Yeah. And now that the Democrats are in control, they are governing as Democrats. And it seems that the Republican leaders have wanted to go to the middle because we want that independent vote. But in doing that, they've totally abandoned their principles. And I fear that it's giving rise to a Tea Party, third party, which will be the complete undoing. And we'll have democratic rule for the next 100 years. I agree. Uh, very accurately and simply stated. Uh, and I think that that's something that we can't lose sight of in the sense that the anger and frustration that a lot of individuals who align themselves with a Tea Party movement or associate in some way come from uh, that space where they looked at the part 94 saying very directly, these are the things that we believe, these are the things we're going to do, and actually said, hold us accountable. Well, guess what? They did. 
And 12 years later, they said, get out of here, all right? So that was a frustration point for a lot of people who just feel that, wait, you, you walked away from the very thing that we sent you to Washington to do. You've walked away and become like the very people we sent you to replace. So how do we trust you again to get it right? Yeah, well, that's a judgment you're gonna have to make. And that's a judgment that Arlen Specter couldn't withstand. So he left. That's a judgment that uh, we've seen uh, not being able to hold in uh, North Dakota. So he retires. So we see, you know, when, when people have to stand, elected officials have to stand before the people in judgment. If they've done a good job, they can pretty much survive it. If they haven't, retirement or switching parties, well, yeah, come on over, you know, you might as well be honest with yourself. But the reality of it is, um, you can't have it both ways anymore. I think a lot of people are coming to realize that. And I've said to the leadership uh, uh, over and over and over again that uh, that clanging sound that you hear outside the windows of Capitol Hill are not the bells ringing for what you're doing up here. It's the grassroots, it's the activists with their pitchforks and their torches coming up the hill. <laughs> and you better be ready. Uh, I can assure you this, that the Republican National Committee will be ready. Uh, and we will do everything that we can to make sure that the principles that were made real for a lot of us uh, by Ronald Reagan are once again the principles that lead this party. And once again, um, allow us to communicate more directly. It's gonna take a lot of work. It's not easy. And it's not gonna happen overnight. But the role that you play in this is now more important than it's ever been. You don't get to sit back anymore and just watch it happen. It's not a YouTube moment, you know? It is a you moment where you're in it and you have a say and that say matters. And uh, we're gonna have a lot of fun getting there. And it all starts again on Tuesday night when the results come in. So stay tuned. Thank you guys very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, man. Appreciate you very much. Thank you very much. Well, thank you all for joining us tonight on behalf of all of you. I'd like to uh, give to Chairman Steele a copy of President Reagan's diaries as signed by Mrs. Reagan. So oh, thank you so much. Thank Mr. you. Chairman. Thank you so much. Wow. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much, and safe travels. Have a nice evening.